I'm going to be going through some of the best early game discoveries, tips and tricks and all that stuff. For example, did you know the land squirt enemies found in places like the Dragonbird ruins don't react well to being poisoned and that's an understatement. Sticking with the exploding theme for now, you might have figured out that the simple torch sold from Calais is useful for much more than just lighting up dark tunnels. Not only is it one of the most effective early weapons against the skeletal slimes, it even lights up the miners in the Limgrave tunnels with a spectacular explosion. Very useful since they're resistant to normal attacks. The torch doesn't have to explode enemies to be effective though. Did you know it's a perfect solution to scare off the wild dogs? Finally, a way to get revenge on those vicious beasts. All right, I admit it. I stretched the truth a bit with that one. The normal torch that you buy from Calais doesn't scare away beasts, unfortunately. But this beast repellent torch sure does. You can buy it from an isolated merchant in the Dragon Barrow region to the north. And it works on lots of things, like wolves, dogs and bears. Now if we're talking about methods to deal with annoying enemies, how can I avoid mentioning skeletons? Throughout your journeys at the Lands Between, you're guaranteed to come across these bony boys in graveyards and dungeons. Some bosses even summon them. And the problem is, they just resurrect after you drop their health bar down to zero. You can deplete their health bar as many times as you like, it won't make a difference. Now there are specific items and spells to stop this from happening, like Holy Water and the Litany of Proper Death Incantation. I'm not 100% certain, but I think in the network test we had before, holy items like these were the only way to stop skeletons respawning. In the full release, all you need to do is strike them in their glowing form after killing them, just before they resurrect, and that's it, problem solved. And if you already knew that, did you know the skeletal Militiaman Ashes you find from defeating the Mariner Field boss in Summon Water Village has the same effect, but this time they rise from the dead to aid you? These two skeletal militia you summon as spirit allies will continue to resurrect by your side, in some cases making them maybe the ultimate tanks. Spooky scary skeletons and shivers down your spine. Another very large surprise in the early game can be found here, next to the Agheel Lake South site of Grace, close by to where you start the game, but it's easy to miss. Go up east from the path and you'll find a weak looking enemy all by himself. Strike him and he transforms into a vicious bear. If you manage to defeat it, you'll be rewarded with a larval tier, which is an item needed to reallocate your character's attributes and change your build later in the game. These are very rare and hard to find, so it's worth picking this one up. We have the map open, which brings me on to my next tip. The map in Elden Ring has a very useful secondary multiplayer function for revealing hotspots. Just press the left trigger to toggle the multiplayer status and all these orange and blue zones will appear on the map, showing where all the PvP action is taking place, useful for invasions and co-op. Something you probably haven't considered, or at least I hadn't, is that all player-made messages are shared globally in all regions. So players can leave messages for each other by using predetermined words, but of course what ends up happening is you get a lot of word puns and inside jokes as players mix and match word combinations together, like fort and knight to make Fortnite references. Certain other puns about fingers and buttholes don't translate so well either. As you can see, there was a mega thread about this on Twitter recently, with Japanese players trying to understand and come to terms with all these weird fort and knight references all over the game. It didn't make sense because it was being machine translated for them. Now, although the Fortnite messages are a joke, that's not to say Elden Ring doesn't change at night, because it certainly does. The lands between become far more dangerous at night, but with greater risk comes greater reward. Certain areas, while appearing peaceful during the day, become the hunting grounds for dangerous bosses at night. Let's take an example in the early game area of North Central Stormhill. This is a remote building called the War Master's Shack. In the daytime, it's home to Knight Bernal, a merchant trading ashes of war. When night falls, however, he disappears, and a deadly bell-bearing hunter takes his place. 
It's definitely worth your time to explore in the dark if you're brave enough. You never know when you might run into a special nighttime encounter. Horrifying though they might be, the loot is often worth it. This next tip is probably unintentional. You probably aren't supposed to be able to do this one. By the cliffs behind the third church of Marika, there's a very enticing ledge lower down. It's an absolute death trap with bloodstains everywhere as everyone tries desperately to jump down there, down the cliff rocks without dying and almost everyone fails. Even if you appear to leap from ledge to ledge on your way down, gravity always seems to catch up with you. However, if you spam dismount from your horse on the way down and you get off, it seems to reset your falling state. And this way you can actually survive and make it to the bottom safely. The reason I think this might be unintentional is because you're clearly supposed to enter this ledge from the cave inside the cliff. Because once I got down there, I couldn't go through the fog door from this side. It was one way only. I got some cool items though. And the point is, for now at least, certain lethal falls can be avoided by jumping off your horse and landing on a ledge halfway down. In Elden Ring, you begin the game by waking up in the Cathedral of Anticipation. And in true Souls tradition, the first enemy you find here is almost impossible to defeat. It appears to be a scripted death because once he takes your health to zero, you're sent to the stranded graveyard via a cutscene. However, it is actually possible to defeat this grafted scion if you're smart about it. And if you're starting a new character, I recommend giving it a go. You have nothing to lose. The easiest character to do this with by far is the samurai. You start with enough arrows to shoot it down while keeping a safe-ish distance. If you do manage to overcome this starting challenge, you receive an ornamental straight sword along with the golden beast crest shield, two incredibly good early game items. The sword can be used straight away and is a pair of one-handed swords that can be buffed in the same manner of the grafted scion. Finally, some of you may not have realized you've contracted a debuff as a result of your reckless behavior. If you have a red square debuff icon under your health bar, that means you've had your health reduced by 5% and it's from Fear, the deathbed companion in the round table hold. I've already seen a few people say they didn't realize they'd had this debuff and they're over 60 hours into the game, which is pretty rough. Essentially, she gives you this debuff if you accept her offer of a hug now to get rid of this debuff, you simply use the Baldachin's Blessing, which she gives to you at the same time. It will be in your inventory. And once the boost expires, the health debuff will expire also. I personally think it's worth taking the hit, or taking the hug I should say, because you can then save the Baldachin's Blessing for a tough encounter so that you get some use out of the poise increase, but I suppose it depends if you'd rather have the health or the poise. To get another one, you'll have to go back and repeat the process as many times as you like, so yeah, with this knowledge, feel free to take as many hugs as you can. Perhaps it will lessen the pain from dying to the Crucible Knight over and over and over again because you're too damn stubborn to just go and explore somewhere else like a normal human being. <laughs> All right, for the remainder of this video, I just wanted to mention the top tens while looking at this footage of me riding my horse majestically. So I'm opening up submissions for the Elden Ring Top 10s now. Some of you have already been sending me stuff, which is nice. You can submit your Elden Ring clips to top10souls at gmail.com. Just send the links there in an email. The first topic will be Top 10 PvP Kills. I think PvP is a good topic to start with because it's overall less spoilery, but it's still really exciting and we get to see some people's early strategies and discoveries. So if you've had any amazing multiplayer moments so far, clips with cool builds or weapons or moments, or if you get some in the next few weeks, make sure to send them in by uploading them to YouTube and emailing the link. It's really easy. Please make sure to explain as much of the context as you can though, like the area name, the weapons. Elden Ring is huge and sometimes I feel like I've still barely seen anything, so <laughs> just letting me know what equipment you're using and so on will be a big help. I hope you enjoyed this video. It's tricky trying to showcase cool discoveries that aren't too spoilery, but are also interesting. And you know that some people won't even have figured out you can ride a horse yet, so it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to know where the levels are. Feel free to share your discoveries for Elden Ring down below. Thanks for watching. Take care. Ciao ciao.